While oil was covering the cost of Britain's unemployment, it was bringing boom times to a small community in the north of Scotland. The discovery of large deposits of oil more than 200 miles from the Scottish mainland presented massive logistical problems. How were the companies going to get their oil to market? It was only 50 miles to Shetland. It made sense for the companies to lay a pipeline and build a terminal there where the oil could be stored before being shipped to refineries. How the Shetlanders responded to the oil companies reveals much about their character and spirit. Some didn't want the oil or the changes it would bring. Could they benefit from the oil and preserve their way of life? I remember a colleague in the Scottish office saying, oh dear, Shetland, they're bound to ride roughshod over them, one of Scotland's smallest and weakest local authorities. I mean, that chap just didn't know Ian Clark. The love of money, says Paul, is the root of all evil. And <laughs> it proved to be otherwise. And it was quite extraordinary that he happened to be there. But he was an extraordinarily tough and determined individual. And, uh, you know, and, and he forced the issue with the oil companies. Ian Clark was the chief executive of the Shetland Islands Council. He knew the oil companies had to use Shetland. His plan was to force through an act of parliament, giving the council complete control of the shoreline. This would give them the power to make all the oil companies use the same terminal, minimizing the disturbance. He then made them pay for the privilege, and this money became the Shetland Oil Fund. As I understood it, what happened was that one of the oil companies came to Ian Clark and said, if you agree to us having our own terminal, we'll do what we do in Anglesey and give you a throughput charge on the oil that goes through it. And he said, more or less, well, thanks for the idea, but you're still going to have a common user terminal. And that gave them uh, the lever with which they got their oil fund. The sticking point was how much the companies would pay, and it was only resolved when the Scottish secretary called a meeting. Willie Ross summoned them to the uh, to, to Parliament, and he said to them, I'm very sympathetic and I'm prepared to be reasonable, but you mustn't push your luck too far because we must have this oil developed, and if necessary, we'll have to legislate. I mean, that's my memory of it. It may not be entirely accurate, but that was what actually eventually broke the logjam, and the Shetlanders then settled, and they got a large amount of money out of it. So do you think that you've beaten the oil companies in any way? Oh, no, not at all, not at all. It would be a brave man who thought that he could beat the oil companies. I remember that John Drummond of Shell saying to me that he'd met very many, a lot of very difficult people in the world, including Colonel Gaddafi, but Mr. Clark was the most difficult of them all. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I think a lot of people felt a bit like that. But he got what he wanted, and Shetland owes a great deal to him. And it didn't hold up the development in the end. Shetland secured what you could call an oil fund. It's already spent almost half of it, but there's still £500 million left. Oil has transformed Shetland and it's still shaping it today. Who benefits from North Sea oil is a fundamental question. Who gets the money has been influencing politics in Scotland for the last 30 years, and it's central to the nationalist argument. That is not surprising, bearing in mind they smelt money. <laughs> Do they, did they not have a point that perhaps it was their oil? Most of it was just off the, the shore of Scotland. Well, they had the point if they were as greedy as sin as they were. I mean, the only thing that fueled nationalism was the smell of oil and money in oil. I mean, it really is the most monstrous piety on their part to say that they are true upholders of the saltire and God knows what. They were after brass, and not let's kid ourselves. But I suppose it gave it, it gave the argument credibility <clears throat> for the first time. Well, certainly it did. I mean, it was an entirely credible argument. We want money for Scots and blow the English and the Welsh. Oh, yes, yes, but that, 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 that I think, would now be described as greed. 
the case for for uh, self-government has been running in Scotland as a serious political issue for 100 years. I mean, 1967 was the first big breakthrough in modern political times, which really was a bit before uh, oil was thought of. Certainly the, there was an impact of oil which gave the argument more economic credibility, which is of course why Bernard Ingham was so desperate to try and knock it down using any tactic he, he, he possibly could. Uh, it was fear that, that motivated Bernard Ingham. He, he was there as, uh, uh, as a, an operator trying to undermine. But what he mistakes is the, the impact of oil and economic confidence as opposed to oil creating Scottish nationalism. It's the Scottish nationalism is existence because Scotland is a nation. That's why people believe in independence for Scotland. The problem for somebody like Bernard Ingham, he can't get his head around the fact that, that Scotland is a country, not a county. There's a lot of jobs in Scotland, don't forget that. I mean, the benefit didn't just come in the revenues, but also the jobs that were created, which I was very keen on developing, and the production for equipment that was needed for the North Sea. So I never saw it as a dominant factor, but it is a fact that having been told for so long we're uneconomic, we're uneconomic, then we finally are economic, and we're still treated as a, as a second-class citizen. So that I always very strongly supported the Scottish Parliament. Scottish nationalism existed long before the oil off Scotland's shore started flowing. But oil did give this political argument some economic credibility. It provided nationalists with a means of financing an independent Scotland. Did they still see it as Scotland's oil? It's Scotland's oil in the sense that the natural resource, or at least about 90% of it, lies in the waters uh, around Scotland. I suppose you could argue it's not to date been Scotland's oil in the sense that the major economic benefit, the economic rent, the revenues, the £250,000, million, pounds, the £50,000 a head for every man, woman, child in this country have flowed straight from the, the North Sea to the Treasury coffers in London. In but that some sense, of that has come back to Scotland again. Some would say well, almost as much as has gone into the Treasury coffers in the first case. Well, there's no, there's no real argument. If you do the balance of £250,000 million, pounds, there's no way the Treasury has given Scotland £250,000 million pounds over the last 25 years. I mean, that would be nonsensical to believe that. Over the years, the benefit hasn't quite amounted to Alex Salmon's £250,000 million. Pounds. But in today's money, that's roughly what's gone to Westminster. I personally think that without oil, if Scotland was self-financing, it would have to either raise taxes or cut public expenditure. Um, the figures all show that, and unless you disbelieve them, which some people do, you know, that's the conclusion you're bound to come to. But then the oil revenues are, are substantial, and uh, at present prices, they would make a huge difference if they were all coming to Scotland. But it wouldn't be a very good idea, even now, just to use them to prop up current expenditure. So far in my investigation, I've spoken to politicians, economists and historians about how oil has shaped Scotland. But I need to talk to people who work in the industry to find out how it will shape it in the years to come. Could the oil that's still in the North Sea be even more important to Scotland in the future? Well, the first person I'm going to talk to is oil engineer Capella Fester.